Thank you. So I welcome you to the 2013 Penn State Lectures on the Frontiers of Science. My name is Barbara Kennedy. I'm the chair of the organizing committee for this lecture series, which we are pleased to be able to offer to you as a free annual public mini course, thanks to the support of the Penn State Eberly College of Science and the generosity of our speakers who volunteer their time to give these lectures to you. Our theme this year is Your Genes, How They Contribute to Who You Are. Today's event is the second in, uh, of our weekly series of six lectures this year. And our speaker today is Ken Weiss, who is the Evan Pugh Professor of Biological Anthropology and Genetics at Penn State. Excuse me. In his research, Dr. Weiss explores the nature of evolution and specifically how it generates the genetic basis of complex traits. Some of the human traits he has studied, for example, include the genetic basis of diabetes and cardiovascular disease. His research interests also include bioethics as it relates to evolution and genetics in our society. In addition to his many research publications in scientific journals and in other formats, he is the author of two influential textbooks, one of which has been reprinted three additional times since its original printing. Dr. Weiss has been honored for his research with many prestigious awards, just a few of which are the Juan Comas Prize of the American Association of Physical Anthropology, the National Institutes of Health, Research Career Development Award, and the Penn State Faculty Medal in Life and Health Sciences. The title of his lecture today is Life's Little Problem, Determinism versus Chance in the Complex Ways of Genomes. Please welcome Dr. Kenneth Weiss. Is the sound, is the sound working? Yes? Okay, good. Um, thanks very much. I hope I can uh, inform you or maybe at least entertain you in the next hour. Um, I'm pleased to have, to have been invited to participate in this series by Barbara. Uh, my talk is going to be an overview and might have been more suitable for the first lecture to lay the groundwork for all the other lectures, but the timing didn't work out that way. But at least I think what I'll say will relate to the one you heard before and the ones that are forthcoming. And I hope that the uh, screen size and the laser pointer will not be an interference with uh, my ability to point out things on the individual slides. I'd like to start out by saying the nature of this series is a reflection of the widespread feeling that genes are important in uh, what makes us what we are. And I'd like to ask, in a sense, a few questions. Why do we think that genes are so important? Where did that idea come from? And one source is the period about 400 years ago when modern science began. And it was realized that to understand the world, we have to make observations rather than just thinking about the world. And we can't draw from sources like the Bible or other religious texts or other classical philosophers to understand the world. We have to actually observe it. And when we observe the world, the assumption is that the world is materialistic. It's made of matter and energy. And that's all that we have to deal with. We don't have to deal with things spiritual in the, or non-material in the sense of trying to understand what we're trying to understand and in this case about life. And we uh, believe, the, the, the belief arose that everything must follow physical laws, laws of nature. They're laws of molecules and forces, and DNA is a molecule, and it contains the information for molecular action in organisms, and that gave us the idea over the last couple of centuries, century and a half or so, that DNA is fundamental to everything in life. And there's another reason, a second reason, and that is known as the central dogma of molecular biology, the idea is that a gene, genes, the DNA, is a code for proteins. Proteins are the functional molecules of life. A zygote, a fertilized egg, in wh by which all of our lives started as a single cell, is, largely thought to con is, is viewed largely as containing genes, or DNA. And since the embryo, all of us, developed from a single cell, genes, DNA, must be responsible for making us what we are. And another reason that we think traits, uh, that traits are, uh, in our bodies and in all living things are genetic is what's called the evolutionary synthesis. 
And this was a realization of, in about 1930 to 1940, uh, following Darwin's work, that evolution is basically about natural selection. Natural selection is the process that generates, as some people have said, design without a designer. It's a historical process that generates complex traits. And Darwin's idea was that this happens by what he called natural selection. Natural selection favors those traits that are good for reproducing and passing on what? Genes into the future. Darwin didn't have the word gene, but it was known that evolution had to work with what's inherited. And since what's inherited is viewed as genes, mainly, therefore genes must be important in determining who we are. And there's another reason, and that is that re relatives resemble each other. You resemble your parents, your children resemble you, you resemble your sisters and brothers, you resemble your cousins and aunts and, and uncles, but to a lesser degree, and that's a systematic s pattern of relationships of traits that are that fit with patterns of inheritance, and that shows that genes must be involved in the traits that, that we have because they resemble, we resemble our relatives. And there's another reason that we have this idea that, that uh, genes are so important, and that is when, when we do artificial selection experiments, Darwin's idea was about natural selection, which is competition in the natural world against the environment and against each other and against other species. But agricultural breeders, plant and animal breeders, and people who breed dogs or pigeons or other things uh, for sport or for fun have shown that if you uh, only allow a certain fraction of the organisms that have traits that you like to reproduce and look at their offspring and continue to do that, there will be a response. The organisms will more and more come to, to be like what you've been favoring. And since most inheritance and the inheritance that you're working with when you do selective breeding uh, is based on genes, therefore genes must be broadly important to what we are. Because most traits, if you do an experiment and do selection experiment, it will respond to selection. Now, if this is a material causally determined world, and if genes are the fundamental causal elements of life, then just what is it that we should expect genes to cause? Put the word in quotes, maybe. Or to determine. What do we mean by genes cause something or genes determine something? Do we expect genes to predict something perfectly? If we know genes, can we predict something? What do we expect to be able to predict perfectly? Or what should we be able to expect with some probability, if not perfectly? And how should we know these kinds of things? So what do we know about genes, their functions, and their determinism uh, is a question, and I'll try to answer that in some ways to try to account for what we see and for the kinds of perplexing problems that we're facing that you'll hear about in the other talks and maybe you heard about from Mark Shriver. I, I wasn't here because I was overseas in fr frozen Finland last week giving lectures uh, while you were having nice warmer weather here by comparison. Um, and then I came back here and it felt just like Finland. Anyway, um, so, uh, uh, so what is it that we know or can ask about genes and their functions and, their, and what they might determine? So here is if we think genes are causal factors, what kinds of genetic questions can we ask? And this diagram here is, a, is one of a uh, schematic di uh, I'm trying to learn this, how to use this pointer. A schematic diagram of a gene where the, I'm going to use this other pointer because I can't manage this one very well. Schematic diagram of a gene, this is a scale of DNA nucleotides along that scale, A's, C's, G's, and T's. And these are regions, these dark regions here are regions that code for protein and these are parts of the DNA that don't code for protein directly, but may or may not have other functions. This is a gene called apolipoprotein E that's related to cholesterol and triglycerides and, and uh, psychiatric problems uh, in certain people. And I just pick it as an example. But we have, if we think genes are causing traits and that they're important in traits, what, what does that mean? What kinds of questions should we be asking or can we ask about them? So here's a simple proposition that seems very straightforward. It's a simple sentence that anybody could write. Lipid levels, lipids are cholesterol and triglycerides and that circulate in the blood. Lipid levels are genetic. I think almost everybody would say, oh, lipid levels are genetic. But if you think about that carefully, that very simple sounding sentence is not at all simple. How would we make sense of that kind of a proposition? Either in um, regard, either as a causal generalization, a kind of law of nature, lipid levels are genetic, or as a particular statement about a particular person like you. If I look at you and I take your lipid levels, do I say, your lipid levels, your triglyceride levels, your HDL levels are genetic? What do I mean by that? It's not so obvious. So let's make the question a little more focused. 
lipid levels, triglyceride and cholesterol, cholesterol levels, are affected by a particular gene, this ApoE gene. That sounds like it's a little more focused, but again, how would we make sense of that as a generalization, that lipid levels are affected by the ApoE gene? What kind of evidence would you collect? How would you collect it? How would you evaluate it to make sense of that statement? And how would you evaluate it if I want to ask about you, a patient, a particular person? Well, that's still a bit vague because ApoE is a gene. That means it's a long DNA sequence and so on. So let's focus the question a little more and see if that helps. The variant, or sometimes called allele, I'll use the word allele maybe later, the sequence variant at a particular position along that scale that I showed you, position 4,075, affects lipid levels. Now that sounds like a much more focused sentence, a statement or a proposition, but, but you should think about what kind of data would you have to have to say that this variant affects lipid levels as a generalization or as about a particular person, such as about you. When you go to the doctor and the doctor says, I've looked at your ApoE gene and this is re relevant to your cholesterol levels, what kind of evidence is being used? And I can show this a little bit differently by this slide. The proposition that this particular variant, here's the scale, this is just a long sequence of five, this is shows a scale of about 5,000 or 6,000 nucleotides. This particular one at position 4,075 from the starting point where we're starting to look at it right here, that this does something relative to cholesterol levels, let's say. That's the proposition. How would you test that? I'm asking, uh, there, there's no one answer. How would you know? Um, what about this? We could say genetic uh, causation is relative. Uh, genetic causation is relative, and the simple propositions are usually not so simple because we can repeat this statement about position 4,075, and in this case, the scale is going the other direction. But we could ask, is it that, var is it that variable's position there, or, or is it this one right here that affects lipid levels? Well, wait a second, what about these ones? These are also variable positions in the same gene. Maybe it's this one that affects cholesterol levels, or maybe this one, or maybe the combination, some combination of those. And since everybody has two copies of every gene, you've got two of these sequences, and they will have different variants. How do we decide what we can predict from the variants themselves about lipid levels if we're asserting that lipid levels are important in uh, uh, that this gene is important in determining lipid levels. Okay, here's a more realistic proposition. Uh, it's really hard. I can break my neck trying to read this slide from down here. Uh, and there's no gene for broken necks while trying to read slides. Um, some combinations, here's a realistic proposition, some combinations of variants at or near the ApoE gene affect lipid levels in some ways, at least under some conditions, at least to some extent, <laughs> possibly. <laughs> and you're laughing, but I can tell you this is the closest to the truth of any of the statements that I've had to so far. That's the problem that we're all dealing with, and if you pay attention carefully to the other lecturers, unless they overstate the case, they will be pointing out that we have these kinds of issues that we're facing all the time in human genetics because technology has allowed us to see a lot of data in DNA that we couldn't see before. Well, if DNA determines everything, then what does DNA actually do? By itself, the answer is it doesn't do anything except fall apart. This is a DNA sequence. DNA only does something when it interacts with other molecules that are in the cell. And that's, the, in a way, you could say the, the, the core of the story that I would like to present today. DNA itself was an inert molecule. In fact, this is a DNA sequence. Again, this is from the same gene. And I just pick it. I could pick any number of d any DNA sequence from any species, plant, animal, yeast, bacteria. You look at this. If you do statistical tests to, to see pattern in here, this will appear essentially random. It's an essentially random string of A's, C's, T's, and G's. You basically, just in itself, it, it, doesn't make any, it doesn't have any pattern. However, because we have lots of ways to study DNA, we can take that same sequence and we can identify areas that have specific pattern or function. And I've darkened these in gray shade here just to show you symbolically that we can, now we are able through all sorts of techniques, laboratory techniques and otherwise, to identify functional subunits within this gene. So that it's a random sequence by itself, but because of what it interacts with inside cells, it's actually loaded with functional elements. And here's a schematic. 
Remember that DNA is just a sequence of nucleotides. Oh, go backwards, go backwards. Okay, go backwards this way. Here, it's every computer is different. Every class is, to, you know why? It's to make us look stupid. It's to get, and that, and well, that gets your sympathy. Okay, so this is, it's just a DNA sequence, but when you look at it, we can block out the units that we're able to identify and say, well, these are the protein coding units, these exons, these things called introns are DNA that's in between the protein coding units and has various kinds of function or no function, we aren't always sure. There's a place where all the messenger RNA is transcribed from here and starts right there. There are some DNA sequence regions that particular proteins will grab onto to make this happen. There are some regions up here, usually up here, that um, near on this side of the gene that allow the gene to be used in a particular type of cells. The reason that all of us in this, each of us in this room is not just a green blob, like something out of a Japanese horror movie, is because we're differentiated. We, our different cells do different things. And the reason they do different things is because they use different subsets of all of our genes. And the reason they use different subsets of all of our genes is because of these regions here that are called regulatory regions. What's this? Oh. Uh, so here's a schematic, again schematic, of a particular gene, of some gene. And this is all just DNA sequence. Okay, here is where the coding part that makes protein starts in the red here. And to get this to happen, a whole bunch of proteins have to come together right about in this place, which is a, one of those regions that I showed you on the previous slide. And then other proteins have to grab onto particular DNA sequences elsewhere in the nearby DNA. And then these proteins have to come together and interact. And the complex of all these things, of which there are often tens of different proteins, will make messenger RNA come off of this strand of DNA, and then that will be turned into protein, and that will be used in the cell. Now, every one of these is a gene, just like this gene, with all of its own regulatory and coding parts. And all of those have to be activated in the same cell in order for the cell to, to make whatever gene product is specified there. Life is about signaling, signaling within and also signaling between cells, and that's how cells differentiate into lungs and stomach and muscle and fi fingers and toes and brains. Signaling is done by s uh, basically by cells releasing some cells releasing some compound, other cells having a molecule, a protein, in their cell surface that can detect this molecule. When they do detect it, they trigger inside the cell a whole cascade of interactions among other proteins, each of which is coded for by a gene. Each of those genes has all these other elements and goes through all of the same kind of process. And then after all this tr series of interactions, then you have other interactions that go in the nucleus of the cell, and they inter involve a whole number of other interactions besides among proteins, each again coded for by a different gene, and that will lead to some gene being expressed. And this is a, this is a, a, network di a diagram of a particular network of which there are many, many different networks of interacting gene products known that are used to make a cell do what it does to respond to its circumstances and so on. And any given cell differentiates into its type of cell because of a whole hierarchy of these kinds of interactions. Lots and lots of genes have gene products, they're proteins. The genes have to be regulated, means they have to be expressed, the protein has to be made, has to be processed properly, and they have to interact in the right time and the right place in order for cells to do their job. That's why we, we're not, we can't be surprised when we see that things look fairly complex. Now we have a theory of evolution going back to Darwin who didn't know about genes because nobody did in those days. Um, and the idea, uh, the, the theoretical ideas about how evolution works because evolution is assumed to be about genes was that we can trace a given gene through time and see what happens to the variation that arises in that gene. Mendel traced uh, traits in pea plants and we can draw family diagrams like this and tra tra trace traits through family members and because we know that uh, Mendel looked at genes whose variation was directly tied to a particular trait that he could measure because he didn't know anything about genes, uh, but we now know that what's being transmitted is not the trait, but it's the particular genetic variant or allele. In this case, there are, at this particular gene, let's say there are two of them, a big A and a little a, and we can follow the big A in the family, and wherever it's present, you have a certain trait. And we then would like to say from an evolutionary point of view, and the theory of evolution was built around the idea of saying, well, at some time a new variant arises and it is transmitted through families over time and over long periods of time 
its frequency in the population evolves, it changes. And the processes of change are called population genetics. And this is basically what we do to try to understand the evolution of a gene and the frequency of the variation in that gene in a species. Well, all new variation arises by what's called mutation, which is a change in DNA sequence. There are some complications. In every one of these things, there are a lot of complications that I'm not talking about, but they don't change the basic principles. I don't want to get into all the complications, or you would all fall, uh, fall asleep, and maybe even I would fall asleep, um, because they're, they're pretty boring in themselves, um, uh, unless you're studying them, and then they become exciting. Um, new variants change in frequency. How, how many copies of those variants there are over time in a population, either by in two main ways. One, just by chance, just because some people reproduce more often than others, and they would transmit copies of their genes more often than others. That's just chance. Or by systematically reproducing more or less because a mutation gives a gene uh, a variant form that has some kind of advantage or disadvantage. And that change in frequency that's systematically due to a physical advantage caused by the gene is called natural selection. That was uh, Darwin's term. So if we look at what happens to a frequency of an allele, a genetic variant at a particular gene over time, this is a simulation that took 10 different runs, independent runs, each line a separate run. S it started with some allele that had a frequency of 0.5, meaning that in the population, half of the copies were, say, big A, the other half were little a, and we want to see what happens to how frequent the big A becomes over time if we just say it starts out at a frequency of 0.5, half, the co half of the population. And what you can see is that each one has a different course of action over, this is 80 generations in a small population. Some disappear, some become fixed. All the, the alternative in that, at that gene disappears. Most are staying in the population during this time. In fact, if the population, is, this is called genetic drift. The frequency is changing like a cork floating in a stream. It's just meandering around gets higher, gets lower. If it gets to zero, it's gone. If it gets to one, the other, any alternatives are gone from the population. But the only thing that's changing it over time is just the chance aspects of reproduction. If you have a bigger population, variants will stay in the population drifting around in frequency a lot longer than in a small population. And there are a lot of ways to estimate how big a human population or the population of other species is, but the point is that they're big enough that new mutations mostly don't last very long, but if they do, they can meander in the population for quite a long time. Now, if a gene, if a variant, an allele, has a f a some kind of advantage, then it will not just drift around entirely, but it will, it will have some more systematic appearance of its trajectory of what happens to its frequency over time. The, the wiggles in this, this is again a computer simulation to make the point. We don't observe this in the laboratory we can if we do mutations in say bacteria or something like that, but in nature we don't observe this, we just infer it and we have the theory for it. It will bounce around in frequency over time, but if it's favorable, even slightly favorable, it will tend, it might disappear by bad luck. The person with the very best genotype in the population could be hit by a bus and not reproduce. So there's always a chance element in reproductive success. Uh, but it'll meander around like this, but it'll tend to be more systematically increasing if, it, if it's favorable. And if it's disfavorable, it'll tend to go, go away more quickly. But natural selection is very slow, and evolution is very slow. So slow that it's very hard to envision. So I would like to give this example of the evolution from a fossil about 7 to 10 million years ago and two species descended from it, one a chimp and one this other strange, decrepit kind of species. This happened about seven or ten million years ago. I'll make an analogy that you're all familiar with. Beaver, st and I don't know if football jokes are appropriate at Penn State right now, but let's just forget that for the moment. Beaver Stadium holds about 107,000 uh, people at the last time I looked at the tally. Now let's just suppose there was a game, and after the game, one person was allowed out of the stadium, and then they shut the gates. And they didn't open the gates again for another generation, 25 years. And then they opened the gates, and they let one more person out, and then they shut the gates. Now, they, as I always like to say, this is Penn State, so they would have to put pizza, Cokes, and condoms in there to make sure that the population didn't, didn't change. But anyway, so one, one person per generation is released. By the time the stadium was empty, it would take 2,145,640 years to empty the stadium if one person per generation, per 25 years, 
That is less than half the time, that two million years, between, that's less than a third of the time between our common ancestry with chimpanzees. And we are considered to be very closely related species. Evolution is so slow that you could not even, most of the time, could not even detect much natural selection from the kinds of data that could actually be gathered in, in the time. Whoops. So here's a simulation again to make this point. Here's a simulation of the kinds of stuff I showed you earlier. These are independent runs of an allele whose frequency starts out at 0.5 and just drifts around by chance. These are 10 separate runs where I allow the, the allele to have a tenth of a percent a tenth of a percent advantage. A tenth of a percent advantage is considered substantial strength of natural selection. A tenth of a percent advantage means if I have that favorable allele, I have a thousand children, and if you don't have the, that allele, you have a mere 999. It is so slow. It is imperceptible and in a way technically formally undetectable most of the time at any given time. Only after the fact do we see the results. And what this shows is 10 separate runs of something with a, an advantage like that. And there is no way you can tell from this or this or this that it's not the same as this. It's very hard to wrap our head around. Darwin knew this. Everybody has known this for a long time. So hard to wrap our head around the slowness of evolution. But that slowness and the drift in the change of allele frequencies has some implications. One is that if you look at a pie chart of the frequencies of different variants at a gene in different populations, what you'll see is that populations nearby have very similar frequencies of their alleles. And populations farther apart, farther away, have different frequencies because these drift events are happening very slowly in different populations. There's mating between adjacent populations so the variants can spread, but they stay very coherent. And there's an um, implication of that for disease and other kinds of studies that are the topic of this series of lectures. And that is a sample here and the causal elements here are going to not be necessarily the same as the causal elements there. Different samples and different populations are going to have different variants and variants in different frequencies and different frequencies of combinations of these variants. We can also reconstruct history. We can show that the Native Americans came from Siberia as we thought they would did from archaeology uh, by using this kind of genetic evidence. It gives us a coherent picture of variation around the world. Another important and troubling fact for people who are trying to understand the causation of disease and other traits from, a, from gene uh, sampling looking at genes is that since the advent of agriculture about 500 generations ago, not very long ago, 10,000 years roughly, there have been a million-fold increase in every genetic lineage that was present at the time in the past. Very, very rapid population growth. And what does that mean? That means a mass of variants that have arisen very recently and are at very, very low frequency. If you a new variant, a new mutation arises in a frequency of one, a copy of one in the whole population. To get to a higher frequency, it has to be around for a long time because we're a slow reproducing species. Most variation doesn't even last very long, but every generation pumps in huge, in a species of seven billion, huge amounts of new variants. And over the last few hundred generations, there's lots and lots and lots of these variants that are so small, so rare that you would hardly ever capture them in a given sample. Or if you capture them in a given sample, they won't be found in the next sample. And if they're causing something like high blood pressure, that's very challenging to try to understand. Now, I've talked about what happens in the fates of single variants. What about the evolution of complex traits that are affected by all these many variants that I talked about earlier, the regulation, the many genes that interact, and so on? What happens, how do we, how do we view those in evolutionary terms? That's a, lot more, that's a lot different from just thinking of a single variant and what happens to it. But they're all part of the same process. Generally, individual variants don't cause a trait. They contribute to it quantitatively. They raise blood pressure by a slight amount or lower it by a slight amount in a given environment, for example. And they don't cause a trait with certainty in that sense. They, they may alter the probability of that trait happening. That's a very elusive problem because what that means in terms of what we mean by the probability of something happening, I'll talk about it later, it's very elusive and difficult. Now, how are evolutionary principles reflected in the genetic architecture or the genetic causal basis of complex traits? And this is a famous, this is an illustration of something that was long, it's been known for a, nearly 100 years. If I just have, let's think of a trait like how tall you are. If I just have a single gene with two states, big A and little a, 
And let's say the little a gives you shortness and the big A gives you tallness. A little dose of shortness or a little dose of tallness. If you, you have two copies of each of these genes, one from your mother and one from your father. If you got a little a, little a variant from both parents, you're short. If you got a big A, big A from, uh, from uh, both parents, you're, you're tall. And if you got one of each, one from your mother and one from your father, you have sort of, say, medium height. Standard, that's what Mendel, the kind of trait that Mendel looked at. Now let's suppose there are two genes doing like this, doing this, and they're identical, just for simple illustrative purposes, the A gene and the B gene with the capital letter making you a little taller and the little letter making you a little shorter. You get two A's, one from each parent. You get two B's from one from each parent. So in a sense, you have four dosages of tallness. So if you, just, if you inherited two little A's and two little B's from your parents, you're short. If you inherited two big A's and two big B's from your parent, you're taller. Or you can have these intermediate numbers of big A's and big B's. Now suppose there are three genes contributing to a trait, and they were identical for, doesn't, it doesn't hinge on the fact that they're identical, but it makes it easier to illustrate. They're identical in their effects. So there's a C gene, and there's a big C and a little c variant. The little c is a shortness dosage, the big c is a tallness dosage. When you put the, the different combinations that you can have from just three genes, what you get is some very short people, some very tall people, some slightly tall, slightly short, and medium height people, and you get this nice looking distribution, which is just what a distribution of height looks like. Or you could use blood pressure, or um, cholesterol levels, or insulin response levels, or all sorts of variables that have this kind of smooth distribution in populations. Showing that the Mendelian inheritance of single alleles, if many genes contributed to a trait, could generate this kind of quantitative distribution of a trait, which can evolve over time the way Darwin thought very slowly that, that important complex traits evolved. This unified what was known from Mendel's work on pea plants, tracing single genes that he selectively chose to look at because they behave properly, with Darwin's idea that most evolution was quantitative and very, very slow. And what we can see is that the, a key fact in all of this is that many different genes contribute, can generate essentially the same trait. That is a key, a very, very important fact. It's been known for 100 years, although not widely maybe appreciated, I think. But it's not a new finding. If you have many contributing genes, you get this kind of smooth distribution. And I haven't even mentioned the environmental effects that add, also add variation. So, and we'll, we'll talk about that again later. The same process uh, accounts for the correlation between relatives, the similarity among relatives, because short people tend to have short offspring. Tall people tend to have tall offspring. So we can account for quantitative distributions of traits, and things that are not just green or yellow like Mendel's peas, but are like height or blood pressure. And we can account for the similarity among relatives. And we can also account for how these kinds of traits would evolve and still look like coherent traits. For example, if being tall was advantageous, and then all of these people might have more or less similar advantageous genotypes, and they might reproduce it more often than these people. And that will shift the frequency of these A's, big A's, big B's, and big C variants in the population. That most of them would still stay around, but that would shift their frequencies and would shift the height distribution ever so slightly, year by generation by generation, in a given direction. So this kind of a model is completely consistent with Darwin's idea of quantitative traits evolving very slowly. And it, it took a major realization, but it's been 100 years, to understand that this was part of the same process of inheritance that green and yellow peas were. And if uh, natural selection is happening in, in the way I just showed in the previous slide, the average of the trait will shift over time. And that's just what we expect and what we see. There's no problem explaining it. But there will also be not only a change in the frequency of these various alleles at these different genes, but there will also be new alleles arising by new mutations at different genes. And maybe some of these other alleles will disappear by chance. So over time, and in different populations, you'll have a different mix of variants at the contributing genes. And if the genes are many, for the reasons that I was talking about earlier in terms of gene regulation and so on, then you're going to have lots of different genes that can contribute, lots of different combinations of their variation. They, they all can vary in the population because mutation can strike anywhere, and lots of different ways to get a similar trait value. So the same model is, comp is com completely consistent with traits evolving the way we know they do. Now, one of the easiest traits to measure 
that has been shown by many, many investigators to be very highly genetic in terms of its variation is just how tall you are. You can collect huge samples because you can, it's easy to measure how tall people are. And if you adjust for their generation, because diets and other things make the average height change in a population, there it looks as if the variation that we see, due to this underlying genetic variation, accounts for about 90% of all the variation in stature. So it's an easy trait to get big samples for. And when that's been done, this is what, this is what we have found. And this involves a method called gene mapping. And very simply, what you do is you, we, we have identif people have identified across the whole genome all of our sets of chromosomes, chromosome 1, chromosome 2, chromosome 3, chromosome 22, have identified variable sites that are variable in the population so that a high fraction of the people have two different alleles at that site. It has nothing to do with their function, but it's just that we know where it is and we can identify it. So we can take a huge sample of people, identify what variation they have at this part of the genome, each person at this part of the genome, this part of the genome, this part, all the way along, for hundreds of thousands of spots in the genome, very narrowly spaced across the genome. And you can do it, and for each site, you can ask whether having the, say, the A allele versus the little A allele makes you taller. And if it does, you can make a statistical statement of whether that's statistically meaningful. And you can plot each of these tests, hundreds of thousands of tests, which you can't see because of the scale, along the genome. And for each one, you get a dot showing how unlikely that the difference between the frequency of that variant in tall people and the frequency in short people, I'm, I'm, I'm simplifying here, but basically that's the test, how unlikely that is to happen just by chance. And points like these and these are very unlikely to happen only by chance, and therefore they're probably contributing to stature. Down in here, you've got thousands and thousands of points. They all blend together. You can't see them. They're, the variation there is, is, is uh, not thought, does not provide statistical evidence for being a, made a substantial contribution or a believable contribution to how tall you are. So people have looked at this, and they've said, well, let's take, what happens if we take, if we look at the effect of the, in this particular slide, the 20 most sig statistically significant contributors to, to stature? Together, their variation accounted for only a few percent of all variation in stature, even though we know that almost all the variation in stature is genetic. And if you extrapolate from what we've seen so far in data to what we might see if we had huge and huge and huger samples, here's what you can do. You can, plot, you can do a plot like this. This is the number of genes that are estimated to contribute to the trait. And this is the number of individuals that you studied and on this axis is the fraction of all the variation that you're accounting for by those sites that your huge samples show have statistically significant contributions to the trait. And what we've got so far is that uh, with sample sizes of approximately uh, uh, 400 and some thousand people, I can't read the slide carefully from here, we have, uh, p people have estimated now, the most recent estimates, 424 different genes contribute to how tall you are. Most of them tiny, tiny effects. And even that only accounts for about 10 or 12% of the estimated uh, genetic contribution to how tall you are. And this, in an essence, is what we're facing time and time again. Blood pressure, schizophrenia, heart attacks, kidney failure. Time and time again, we find a few genes that have substantial, repeatable effects on the trait. And this sea of hundreds of variants that we can hardly identify, we can't replicate in subsequent studies. And the individual effects are very, very small. And this is the problem when we're trying to un understand causation and what we mean by a saying that a gene causes a trait and so on. We are facing this kind of a problem, and this is not unique to stature because the same kind of funding finding is being found in all sorts of other species in all sorts of other kinds of studies. This is a general depiction of what we're finding and the nature of the way biological traits are caused. Um, and the, uh, it depends, uh, th this same finding, the findings are similar whether we're doing something like comparing cases versus controls, diabetics versus normal people, or whether we're comparing, we're just looking at the effects on some quantitative trait like height or blood pressure. It's not, it's not because we're studying disease it's, it, or, or versus normal traits, it's the sort of the way life is. Now people have said, well, if this is the case and it's so hard to find these variants, then maybe we shouldn't be just looking at the whole range of variation across the whole the, across the whole uh, uh, range of the trait values, but maybe we should be looking at the extremes, comparing the genotypes of short people versus large people and using a computer where the labels actually stay put when, where they were when I designed the slide. 
but that's even harder than figuring out the gene that causes for stature. Um, well, that's max versus PC, and anyway. Um, so looking at the extremes, they said, well, that will be a strategy. We'll find the genes that are really contributing to being tall because they'll be very different in very tall people compared to very short people. And without, uh, except for pathogenic, really pathogenic mutations in genes that really do make people short and are easy to find, basically recent work has, sa has shown that this is not what you expect. This is not what you find. What you find is basically the same variance here as here in the kinds of samples that we collect. And what that suggests is either different combinations of these variants are what are responsible for people being taller, or very rare variants that cannot be detected with these kinds of methods, but are a huge contributing fraction of what's going on. For the reasons that I said, we've got this huge amount of rare variants because of our population expansion since the invention of agriculture. So even this trick of saying, let's concentrate on small versus large, and there we'll find the main contributing genes, it's not looking, out, it's not looking like that is going to solve the problem that we're facing. Basically, when we do one of these mapping studies, what do we find? We find a few, this is a pie chart of the contributing individual genes. We find a few with effects big enough that we can get statistically significant evidence for them, that we believe that this is not just a sampling artifact, and that we can even maybe repeat in one study and then in another, in another study, and then there are all of these here that we know must contribute to the trait because relatives values are correlated with each other and, all, and twin studies and other studies show that there are these genetic effects but they simply cannot be identified with these kinds of samples. Some people, maybe some people who will talk in this series, think that we should just get even bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger sample sizes so we can identify these ever smaller and smaller and smaller effects. I don't think that's a pretty good, useful way to spend money but that's just my opinion. What you would expect under these conditions is that from sample to sample to sample, or in the given population over time because of the evolutionary processes I've tried to explain, you will get different mixes of genes and their variants contributing to a trait. It's exactly what, you, what we're finding, and it's what we expect for the reasons I, that I've tried to outline, but I think it's not very widely appreciated in full that this is what we're facing. Personalized genomic medicine is a promise that you are investing a lot of your tax money in, for better or worse. And various people will give you in this series will give uh, presentations that stress where they think these kinds of things will work. But if we if we if we take for example people with a an A allele at a particular variant that we think is related to a trait versus ones who have uh, a little A allele and we look at their average trait value, their average height, their average blood pressure, cholesterol levels, glucose levels, insulin levels, we'll find a difference. And if the samples are big enough, even a numerically small difference will be statistically significant. Many of the things being found by these kinds of methods raise your risk by a factor, sometimes they'll say 30% increase in risk. And man, you get scared as hell with that. But if the risk is 1%, 30% increase in risk means the risk goes to 1.3%. These are things that are very hard to keep in mind, but they're typically typical kinds of findings. But anyway, not only that, um, we don't, this is the average of the group of people with the big A allele, and this is the average of the group of people with the little A allele. There's lots of variation. So although this is the average, there's a, the probability is roughly this high that if you have this allele, this will be your trait value. And the probability is this high on this scale that if you have this allele, this will be your trait value. And in fact, there's a huge overlap, even if their mean differences, the average differences, are statistically significant. There's a huge overlap between these groups. This is a big challenge. Well, what about quali these are quantitative traits like blood pressure. What about qualitative traits like whether you'll have a disease? Well, suppose that we do a study like this and we, and we go back here and we say, well, if you have the big A allele, you have a such and such, a, say, a 5% risk of a disease. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean that everybody with that allele has a 5% risk? Or... Could that mean that 5% have 100% risk and the rest have no risk? Or could it mean that there's a distribution of risk whose average is 5%? These are very serious questions and they're very, very hard to answer. And things get more complicated uh, when you start to think of what we're trying to do if we try to predict from genes to these kinds of traits, especially late onset traits. The genetic effect has to be even as trivial, even when we measure it as it is, but the actual genetic effect, if this doesn't give you a trait until you're 40, 50, 60, or 70 years old, that is such a tiny genetic effect that we're trying to chase, almost trying to chase rainbows. It's very elusive. 
So here's the genetic basis that you're born with that we can see when you're born. And then that, makes, that codes into a protein, and there are various mechanisms that have to be in involved in order for that to make a protein. And then early environments will affect how that protein works because the proteins act on other molecules like dietary molecules and, and so on. And those will then, they will have some variation. That will add some variation, as does the, the uh, efficacy of producing the gene product. And then you have all sorts of interactions among the many molecules that make a trait like, like uh, uh, insulin metabolism or glucose metabolism and so on. And then you have later environments, like the environments that we're all experiencing, sitting here on Saturday morning in the cold, going out in the cold, eating whatever you're going to eat for lunch, not getting enough sleep, eating too much sleep, drinking too much, have too much coffee, don't smoke, or smoking too much. All those things complicate these, these factors. And then there's probabilistic risk, because these things are probabilistic. They interact or they don't by chance. And that's what we're trying to predict. And the question is, if this is what we're trying to predict, how well can we see the underlying genetic causation? This is the challenge, and it's serious. For example, the, one of the most dramatic, undoubted, serious, tragic causes of major disease is our mutations in, a gene, in genes called BRCA1 or BRCA2, which lead to very high risk for breast cancer. Everybody's probably heard about these. These are classic cases. There isn't a single skeptic. Nobody doubts that these, that this gene, these two genes are very clearly causally related to breast cancer. But this is the probability, if you were born before uh, 1940, this is the probability by age, starting at birth up to age 90, that you would have breast cancer if you're carrying one of these mutations. If you were born after 1940, this is the probability. This is a huge probability, but look at the difference. It's almost twice this probability for people with the same, known to have the same mutation. And this is because, presumably, because of different lifestyle experiences. And you can list all the favorite factors, how many children, when you have your children, exercise, diet. But the point is that this is the, uh, as clear a cut in, an example as we have of an undoubted risk factor for a very serious disease, breast cancer. And even then, the actual risk that you assign to people depends heavily on environments. And that can be seen maybe in this slide. Uh, well, here's another example. This is something that I did a little work on in Finland. I wasn't doing this last time I was there last week, but uh, there's a region called North Karelia in Finland, and it was notorious for having the world's highest heart disease risk. So the Finnish government and health department tried to impose, uh, tried to understand what this risk was. And over about a 20-year period, the risk was reduced by 85%. And that was done by dietary change. It had nothing to do with genes. The genes are the same. The same people are the same. It was strictly environmental change. So here, this shows how s serious the environmental component, most of which we don't understand, has to do with most of the diseases that we're trying to study, not the ones that are present at birth. And, and others. there are other examples where environment doesn't seem to make much difference to risk. But for most of the kinds of diseases that we're talking about in terms of do your genes make you what you are, are very heavily experienced, uh, affected by life experience. And here's the problem, and it's a deep, deep problem, and I don't know the answer, but I think we need to take it more seriously because people are trying to do your genotype at birth and use that to predict your risk. Now, how are they going to predict your risk? Well, you take data that you have, and you look back in time on the people that you sampled, and see what you look at their genotype when they were born, and you see what happened to them. That's called retrospective risk. So, for example, here's the genotype. There could have been a lot of different environments, but whatever people lived through, this is the risk that people have today that you can estimate looking backwards. We may even know some of these environmental factors. But pr uh, pr personalized genomic medicine is supposed to predict your risk in the future. And that depends on environments, and we have no idea what they're going to be. And yet we know there are huge changes in prevalence and incidence of most of the diseases that we're talking about. And that we know because the, the, the degree of genetic involvement is 30 or 40 percent even, but we know that environments and lifestyles make a huge difference. And yet we also know we cannot predict what those environments will be. We don't even know what the environments are usually, so we can't predict what the same environment exposures would be in the future. And there may be new exposures that we just simply can't predict, don't know about, or don't measure. So it, we have to be very careful when we're predicting risk. And the risk that we predict based on genotype is only like 5%, 20%, 30% more than a risk that's already small. We have to be very careful how 
how seriously we take such risk predictions and whether the estimate, even if it's done by the very best science based on retrospective analysis, is very useful for prospective analysis. So I'll summarize uh, some of the points here that I've tried to make. And if we think in terms of evolution, this is a scale, this is very schematic. Um, uh, uh, the frequency of different genetic variants in an evolutionary sense is most variants are, have low frequency, a few variants have high frequency. What about the age of the variants? Most variants, because I've talked about this rapid population expansion, are recent. A few variants are old. Geographic distribution, well, most low frequency recent variants have to be local geographically and different from sample to sample to sample. There'll be a few that are more globally distributed with high frequency. The potential effects on natural selection and fitness, that's the word for how well the genetic variant af affects your ability to reproduce, mostly very weak, and I've showed you that when it's very weak, you can hardly tell chance from selection. And there'll be a few that are very strong. Well, what about function and the, in the context of things like epidemiology and the, the health-related tra traits that a lot of people are interested in and that a lot of the speakers in this series are going to talk about? What about causation? We have a few traits that have very simple causation. There are a lot of traits that we know they're caused by one gene and we know what the gene is. There's no doubt about that. Th and those are, we know those. But most traits, many traits at least, are more complex. They involve, m most, more, more complex is more common. How about the penetrance or the effect the, on, of a particular genetic variant on whether or not you get the trait? A few are very high and we know about those, like the breast cancer variant. Most are very low. They have very low predictive power on their own. The mode of inheritance, some, as, we, as I've said, clearly are single gene or almost one or two genes. We know that. Most traits, the inheritance seems to be polygenic to involve these many different contributing genes for the reason that I've tried to spend the last hour boring you about. The size of the effect on, on risk, a few have very large effect. Most have very small effect. And even the large effect ones are uh, uh, modified by environments in ways that are challenging to understand. The, the involvement in traits, a few m genetic uh, mutations in, are focal. They only involve one simple trait, or the gene is only expressed in one particular tissue. But most genes are expressed in many different tissues. We call that pleiotropic. And what their, their effects of mutation on the gene would be, uh, of a gene, would, if you can detect them, are syndromic. They affect multiple different tissues. Again, they make things fairly complex. So this is a sort of very schematic generalization. And of, of these things, overall, in aggregate, most things are like this. A few things are like this. And the importance of this is that these ones fit theory going back to Mendel and others on genetics very well. They work out. We can find them. We can document them. We, hundreds of them are known. They're usually very rare. But they're clear-cut genetic traits. There are a lot of these things with intermediate strength of effect where they aren't too numerous which we can sometimes identify and which are people are trying hard to identify now with very big samples that you'll hear about in these other lectures. But most traits are either difficult or damn near impossible to identify specifically or to understand in any specific terms on what they do. And I would say this is a schematic chart because of an important thing, unlike physics and chemistry, that we have to face in biology. And that is we don't have a rigorous theoretical expectation for this, the shape of this spectrum of effects. We, th we can look at it empirically, and we have some rough ideas of how it should look, how it should be, but we don't have specific, uh, we don't have things like the law of gravitation that will predict this gene will have so many nucleotides and so many exons and such and such an effect on a trait. And different combinations of, effa of factors can yield, different, uh, can yield similar results. So it's not just looking at one gene. It's looking at combinations of genes. And if you have 100 genes contributing, there's uh, countless combinations that you might have to look at. And you won't get samples of them enough to actually characterize their, their effects. No one factor generally determines the result. And we don't have, at the moment, underlying fundamental principles for what is called an emergent trait, for how these complex traits arise out of multiple causation. That is a big challenge for the next generation of scientists. Um, Part of it is that most science was developed in over the last few hundred years based on laws of nature which were regular, rigorous, highly determinative pr principles of how physical world worked. We don't have that kind of thing in life. And one reason may be our ignorance, which may be correctable in, in time. But another reason is that the whole mechanism, the way life works, and the way evolution worked to generate life is by things being different. 
things have to be different to evolve, to adapt, and to change. So life is based on things not being replicable in the way that dropping balls from the Tower of Pisa, Leaning Tower of Pisa, was for Galileo. We have it much more complex because the nature of life is to be different. And we're trying to use methods that are designed to measure things that are the same, that can be repeated, like flipping coins or gambling or things like that. So it's a big challenge. And in sum, let me just sum up that we have, we have uh, genomic technology has been enormously powerful in, in revealing complexity. I would say an uncomfortable level of complexity that we knew to expect, but a lot of people wishfully thought, like ostriches, that we wouldn't find and hoped that we would find things that were simple. What we're finding was intuitively known in Darwin's time and before and was theoretically expected a century ago, as I've tried to explain. And in a way, Mendel misled us about this, leading us to think that genetics would be simpler than it is. Why? Because Mendel wanted to breed better pea plants, and he chose traits that worked. A lot of traits in pea plants did not work the way Mendel's laws would s say. And Darwin knew about this, too. Um, and variation is produces a spectrum, or I would even call it a fog, of probabilistic determinism that I've tried to talk about in this past hour. So the excitement that we get and the urge to keep going and scale up is because we do find lots of things that work in the usual Mendelian way. They're tractable, they're clinically useful, and so on. But that can distract us from the much more challenging task of trying to understand how things that are truly complex actually work. And um, I think for this we may need to adjust our notions of causality, of prediction, of determinism, and to come to grips with the meaning of probability and complexity in ways that we haven't done yet and that our legacy of how science works may not have equipped us properly to do. Um, this is just my opinion. And uh, I would just like to add one other thing, the just, just for fun and for speculation, and that is, what about things like behavior, which are very hard to classify and very hard to predict, but a lot of people are thinking that we might be able to predict behavior from DNA. And one of the issues has to do with how well how the degree to which what we inherit, our DNA, determines what we are and what we will be. When it comes to how long your limbs are going to be, maybe you don't care. But when it comes to whether or not your brain, your mind, is something purely predictable from material cause, or whether it's independent of material cause, that's an age-old age question and a fascinating question. It has to do with consciousness, but also with the idea of free will. The idea of free will in Western culture is that you are a free agent to make decisions of moral moral decisions of your own, and God will judge how well you do that. If we're predetermined by our molecules, if DNA predict who will be and what will be, and we don't have free will to make, make these changes, then we can't be held responsible for our actions. These debates have been going on for a long time. And I'm not going to get into the religious idea, religious aspect of these things because it's not my purview, but let's just take a purely materialistic point of view and say, can this, can this inform us at least about the illusion of free will? And I would say this, the brain has billions of neurons. These neurons are affected by all these complex gene signaling interaction systems that I've talked about. There's a huge amount of probabilism in whether neurons interact, whether a transmitter is secreted, whether it's received, whether it's secreted at the right time, and all of that. All of these have a probabilistic element. And that probabilistic element, with all of these different factors, I think makes it clear why it seems as if we have free will and why we should not attempt to predict what we're going to do and what we're going to have for breakfast from our DNA. Now, whether or not that, and that may mean in principle, we cannot predict from DNA alone, from our, from our material inheritance, what we're going to do and how we're going to think and how we're gonna, what we're going to decide, except maybe in the most very broad general terms. So it doesn't get into the religious aspect of moral responsibility, but it does perhaps address a, an ability to help understand why it seems like we're free agents inside our heads, even though this is a material world. And thanks. Please, please hand down your questions so that I can ask your questions to Dr. Weiss. We have volunteers who will run up and down the aisles and collect them. Thank you. Dr. Weiss, um, after hearing your talk, um, I am wondering if having my genome sequenced uh, by a service such as 23andMe will tell me anything useful about myself. What do you think? I don't really want to answer that question. Um, for, for seriously highly penetrant genetic variants, the ones that have a very strong effect, 
you, are, you probably already know if you have the trait. For most of these variants, not everybody will get the trait, and the risk may be, as I've said, 1.3, 30 30% greater, 5% greater, even, even three times greater. If the absolute risk is 1%, that means your risk from having your genome prediction will be 3%. Now, if you, if you want to make decisions based on that, then I would only ask you to keep in mind the retrospective problem of risk estimation, which is what these services have to rely on before they can make predictions of the future, of your future risk. Now, these services can detect many different genetic variants that might be put children that you have in the future at risk. There are medical, legitimate medical profession called genetic counseling that can advise you on these things as well, those of you who might want to have, think about these things in terms of family planning. But in terms of absolute risk for other kinds of disease, uh, I would just say caveat emptor and let the other speakers say that I'm all wrong because I'm not a true believer. Please, please comment on the future of gene therapy. There are two ways to think about gene therapy. One is to take a, a trait that's caused by a genetic variant that we know about and whose effects we know and whose mechanism we know and treat it by using a, 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 a therapy targeted to that genetic variant. And there are many examples in terms of cancer therapy and other therapy where a, specifically, a specific known genetic variant can alter clinical decisions. The other, so that would be useful. It's being oversold right now, I think, most of the time, but there are still examples where it seems to be working. A lot of drug trials that are targeted to genes end up not working, but that's just life because these things are complex. But, but a lot of it is working, and a clinician is the one you have to ask about that. Now, as far as other kinds of gene therapy, there are these ideas that will, and, and a sobering thought is, sickle cell anemia is in your blood, an accessible tissue. It's a single gene. The protein change is very well known. It's been known for like 60 years. And we still, to my knowledge, do not have an effective treatment for sickle cell anemia that involves the gene per se. So it's sobering how hard this challenge is, even for something that ought to be as easy as you can get. So but one thing, one, uh, uh, secondly, genetically based decisions on reproduction have been successful in terms of carriers of diseases in the U.S., the Jewish population, carry, uh, Ashkenazi Jewish population, has basically eliminated new cases of Tay-Sachs disease by prenatal screening. So in that sense, when you really know a mutation and it really an allele and it really has a strong effect, it works to, to do something in that sense. It's not therapy exactly in, in that example. Finally, there is the idea that gene therapy will take a gene and alter the gene so that it won't be transmitted in future generations. That will require some exotic technologies that could be done whether they can be done practically on a, on a large scale it remains to be seen, but that has to do with taking a corrected gene, putting it into an egg cell, basically a nucleus of a cell, getting rid of the other the defective gene, and then in vitro fertilization. And that, the techniques are being developed to try to do that, but I think that's farther in the future in terms of anything on a population scale. How does the Nazi theory of um, eugenics differ from modern genetics? This is a very good question, and this is one we need to think about. The belief that it's all in your genes is so easy to come by because we know about Darwin, because we're materialists, because we believe in science. The belief that that makes who you who you are is also very easy to be used by society in a judgmental way and in a discriminatory way. This was done in the eugenics movement where the, quote, defectives were being got rid of in one way or another or forcibly sterilized to improve all of our genes so we didn't have, as a species, as many bad genes as were there. The Nazis took that to the nth degree by exterminating the, quote, inferior races. If you think our society, if you think human beings are all goody-goody people and our society is not prone to being judgmental and to using genetic data in a discriminatory way, then I think you're living in Gaga land. I think we need to be those of us old enough to remember history ought to learn the lessons of history and to be very measured in what we think is legitimate to study and legitimate to do and how to keep confidentiality and how to keep this out of policymakers' hands where it could be done, where social harm could be done. It can, uh, with DNA available now, you can, uh, there was a recent paper on this, you can go into DNA databases that people can access and identify specific individuals by their DNA even though they've not given their names. And that gets into a technical thing, but 
DNA is very telling in terms of identification of individuals. If you start to believe that particular variants make you stupid or will make you a super basketball player or makes you vote uh, liberal versus conservative, you laugh. There's someone at Penn State who believes that, that genes make you how you vote. Uh, this kind of thing, to me personally, is potentially very dangerous. It's dabbling in it. It's always stated by professors as being for the good of society and for the good of knowledge. And after all, this is knowledge and we can't stifle knowledge. So you have to make your own societal judgments. But these are sociopolitical issues. I think I found two related questions. One is, if evolution is so slow, how do the finches in the Galapagos Islands change so quickly? Or is this a myth? Um, is it an environmental effect only? And the related question is, what are some factors that can speed up ext or extreme, make extreme the natural evolution of genes or a particular gene? Okay, so evolution is typically very slow. That's what we think. Now, the Galapagos finches, there was a period of drought, I think it was about 10 years, something like that, and that was a very severe selective pressure on the beak shape of finches in terms of what food was growing because of the drought and what they could eat. That very severe selection is like artificial selection in, by agricultural breeders, and of course it works just the way we would expect. Although even at the end of that 10 years, most of the variation was still there and the beaks are starting to go back to the way they used to be. So, uh, so, that, so uh, bacteria, uh, antibiotic resistance, uh, susceptibility to infectious disease, all those things show that when strong selection does occur, it works the way we thought it would. It's just that most selection for most traits, and after all, blood pressure, glucose levels, and the kinds of things that lead to chronic diseases in humans, those, are not, those were not under intense selection in the past because people didn't live long enough for even for those genetic variants, most of them to have their effect. So when there is strong selection, we respond the way you expect. When there's weak selection, I think that's what's more, more typical. Did Mendel actually know which traits would work for him from his experience as a gardener, or was he really just lucky in his choices? No, he very systematically knew which traits bred true in plants, and he used different strains of plants, the green strain and the yellow strain, the wrinkle strain and the smooth strain. He also knew very well that some traits didn't work, and he didn't study them because they wouldn't be useful for his kind of hybridization approach to improving pea plants. He also was very frustrated when he looked at some other plants and other traits that should work, and they didn't work. And it turned out that there were some things about the chromosomes that, he didn't, that nobody understood at the time that explained why it didn't work, but he was very frustrated because he thought he had discovered a, quote, law of nature, and then he found these traits, and even though the traits looked like they segregated truly in, uh, in, in generations, they didn't follow his rules. So that w took a long time for it to be worked out what was the reason, and that was worked out in the early 1900s. So many good questions, a little time. Well, ask me a bad question. <laughs> okay. I've probably given you a lot of bad answers. <laughs> Here are two related questions. Um, is the prob probability causation that applies in quantum mechanics fundamentally different from genetics? And the related question, can we not use quantum theory to study genes as genes and quantum theory are probabilities? Okay, I think it this is a very it. difficult, very, very, very relevant question. Quantum theory, and I don't understand it in detail, basically talks about things like the position of electrons around orbiting around atoms and how they're probabilistically determined in a strange way, and they're not like single particles that go around the nucleus the way the Earth goes around the sun. And I, I'm probably a little off base even there, but I don't. But, but what I would say is there are debates about whether things are causally truly probabilistic or whether probabilistic cause is just a matter of our ignorance at present. Now, if you, Mendelian inheritance of big A's versus little a's is typically thought of as truly probabilistic. You have a 50% chance of transmitting a big A, a 50% chance of transmitting a little a to any one of your children. Now, is that the true way things work? Or is that because of, of Brownian motion of the molecules in the cell, which itself could be argued is, could be in a way deterministic if you only knew every molecule in the cell? Or is that, uh, and, and, or is it uh, deterministic again? If we knew every molecule, we could predict it. Well, flipping a coin is instructive. If you flip a coin, it looks like a truly inherently probabilistic process. But there's a guy who's now a statistician in California who's built a machine that flips a coin and gets the same result every time. 
And he's shown from physical principles that if you know enough about mechanics, just classical mechanics and physics, that you can predict or account for the fact that once you start this coin, let's say heads up, with this particular amount of force, it'll always land whatever it is, tails. So it's a deterministic process that, we, that looks probabilistic because we don't know enough. And there is a huge range at which, uh, of things where I think that, I that, that, that applies, where we just don't know enough. But when you have so many individual things, so many interacting factors, and so many possible two-way, three-way, four-way interactions, each with a slight probabilism involved, even if it was purely deterministic, it will never, in my opinion, not in any of our lifetimes, even in young people's lifetimes, will be worked out in a deterministic way. Whether, the ultimate, whether there's ultimate probabilism, you know, is a question for prayer, maybe. I don't know. If there is so much uncertainty with studying genes, how are the results presented from research? They're presented, uh, uh, do I have to answer that question? I think there are many incentives for overstating the case. I think that's well documented. The pressures in universities like this one here called Penn State and around the world, the pressures to get grants, the pressures to make findings, the pressures to feel important, the pressures to be important, the pressures to cure disease, the pressures to make important contributions to society, the pressures to get salaries and tenure, all tend to put, and the news, the news media hungry 24-7 for stories that want big headlines, that pushes us to make overstatements. Also, there is a systematic, well-known problem with exaggeration and, or even, quote, fraud. That's outright fraud is pretty relatively rare, but exaggeration and misleading statements are not so rare. And um, there is a huge problem with underreporting, systematic underreporting by science journals of negative results. A study that doesn't find anything is considered a flop or is not publishing. It won't get published or it won't get published in a major journal. That's by policy of the editors. So that is a huge problem. And we don't know the extent of it because people don't publish unpublishable results. Or they find in a study what they can claim they found, and they ignore the stuff they didn't find but could have reported. Can you explain how Shakespeare's sonnets were recorded on d a DNA strand recently? I heard it on NPR. I, this is not um, my question, but I did hear this. <laughs> I heard something about that, and I, I don't... I don't uh, if you have letters, C, G, A, G, A, C, G, T, and you put them in particular orders and you, and you allow them to, to stand for something else, you can, you can, uh, you can uh, make it seem like DNA codes for uh, Shakespeare. I was going to, if I had time, I was, gonna, I was actually going to do something here. I was going to say, let's, we think we can predict things from genes on up. Uh, what, if we, what if we played a movement of a Beethoven symphony? How much of that do we think we could predict from Beethoven's genes? <laughs> At what level would we have to say the genes ha can tell us nothing about Be the fourth movement of Beethoven's seventh, which is what I've got, actually, I could play it here. I set it up in case I had time. Well, you say, well, you can't predict a particular symphony. You can't predict that Beethoven would, would compose in A minor, A major, because he also composed in other keys. You can't predict where, at what point down the line can you say that you can actually predict something? And my answer is, if, if you don't even have to consider environment, my answer is it would be so generic that it would be s mostly useless. That's my answer. So this question is related to your answer. We consider genes and environment to be the greatest factors in who we are. From zygote to embryo, what are the four greatest factors in the mother's genes that influence this developmental period? Developmental what? Period. The, be, the period developmental between the full stop or developmental age of gestation? The four greatest factors that the mother's genes play in influencing the development of the zyg from the zygote to the embryo. Okay, what I would say in for, uh, on the spot, I would say first, it has to do with the uterine environment. Second, it has to do with genes related to cellular differentiation and things like that. Third, it would have to do with with uh, uterine environment, I mean by chemical environment, nu nutrients and that kind of thing. Third, it would have to do with the way the DNA is modified by the mother bef uh, on the egg cell before it's fertilized. And that has to do with how chemical modifications in specific places in the genome are applied. And those kinds of things can be heritable. And fourth, uh, I don't know. When I say that the genes or the environment, that's such a hand-waving term that it can apply. I can always be right. I could never be wrong. So uh, 
the, the genetic variation in the mother will have to do with her ability to have implantation in the uterus work, the ability to, to provide a proper placenta, all those kinds of things. The modification of the genes will have the, uh, called epigenetics, it's called, uh, will have to do with how genes are used. And then the nutrient environments and those things like that are actually heritable. They can be inherited from generation to generation, but they're not encoded in DNA sequence. The fourth thing is maybe whether she treats herself well while she's pregnant and doesn't smoke. Okay, you said epigenetics. We have two questions about that. Can you explain how epigenetic gene switches work? Are these inherited? And the other epigenetic question is, does epigenetics complicate or shed light on this overall problem while trying to make sense of this complex problem? Epigenetics refer, in the way it's used nowadays, refers to the modification of DNA sequence. It adds groups like called methyl groups. Little chemical groups are added onto the nucleotides. They don't change the nucleotides. They just modify them chemically. And I showed you that uh, stereotypical structure of a gene that had regulatory elements. Those regulatory elements get stuck bound to by proteins in the cell. And when those proteins come together, I showed you a couple of slides about that, they cause messenger RNA to be transcribed. If you methylate these or modif modify these nucleotides, the proteins can't get there. They can't stick on. They can't bind. It's like trying to hug a porcupine, and um, the gene won't be expressed. And that DNA methylation is an actively done process. It's done in males and females. It's done between generations, but it can be inherited from generation to generation. And there's also a probabilistic aspect to when and where these methylation effects or these epigenetic effects will happen. So they uh, just add another complication that cannot be predicted from DNA alone, but that are in genetic in the sense of inherited by the cell, that affect how the genes are used in the cell, and that's just one more level of complication to the ones that I've actually talked about. What was the diet change in the Finland population that reduced heart attacks? There was fruits and vegetables and things like that. Unless if you've ever been to Finland, it's wonderful food, but it's lethal. I mean, it's <laughs> salted fish, salted meat, cheese, fat, milk, milk, uh, all sorts of things like that, and they just went to a much more vegetable diet. They were going to work out a, a study with Italians who had, a, who had the, quote, Mediterranean diet that's so healthy. And what they wanted to do was the Finns would, operate, would, 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 ta would take on the Mediterranean diet for a month or two, and the Italians would take on the Finnish diet for a month or two, and then they would see what happened to blood pressure, cholesterol, and stuff like that. The Italians refused. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, Finland is a great place to be, but you don't want to stay there too long if you're worried about your cardiovascular system. Are genetically modified foods produced in the same way breeders used to breed animals? For example, Darwin's, and Darwin's methods and Mendel's methods? No, not, not exactly. Um, there are various ways. There are lots of different things being done. Normal breeding is if you want woolly or sheep, you have a bunch of sheep. You take the sheep that are wooliest and you let them reproduce and the rest become mutton. Then the next generation, you take the sheep that are wooliest and you let them reproduce and the rest become mutton. Over time, all your sheep become woolier. Genetically modified animals and plants are ones in general, I think the purpose of this question is where a specific gene, such as one that has to do with herbicide resistance, is put into the plant. And that, or there are, there are many examples like that. Then you can spray the plant with herbicide, spray the field with herbicide. The plant doesn't die because it's got an herbicide resistance gene, but all the, all the pests, all the weeds die. So it's been a gene introduced, not by, by classical breeding experiments, but by you put a transgenic gene into a seed, basically, and then breed from that and then replicate that. You mentioned natural selection and genetic drift. Last week, sexual selection was mentioned. Would you consider this natural selection or an aspect of genetic drift? No, it's, it's like natural selection. Darwin realized that some things, like how fast you run, depends on whether you get away from the cheetah that's chasing you. And then he looked at other traits, like feather colors and things like that, that did not seem to have anything to do with physical survival or getting food. And then he realized, and it, it was a deep understanding, I think, that if they help you to get mates and reproduce successfully, they can be favored. And if they're genetically controlled, those genes can, can be favored. So it is definitely a form of natural selection. It's called sexual selection because it's not the usual kind of survival uh, blood and guts kind of uh, effect. There's a question that's difficult to read um, because it's so long, but I think that the question is, 
um, in genetic counseling, in terms of premarital counseling, um, how much should you base the choice of your mate on uh, genetic counseling? <laughs> this gets into the social issues of abortion and in vitro fertilization. What you can do, genetic counselors are trained professionals in clinical settings who, if they're good, they know their business and they're not just selling predictions. What they will tell you is that you are at such and such a risk, estimated in general, they'll estimate it from reliable data, for having a seriously affected child. Now, you can either decide not to get married or you can decide to get married and have uh, early amniocentesis, an abortion, or you can decide to try in vitro fertilization where a bunch of eggs or sperm, depending on who's carrying the damaged gene, are screened and ones without the de defect are taken and used to fertilize and then implanted in the mother. So genetic counseling can help those kinds of approaches to family planning. And that's been effective in reducing uh, thalassemia, which is an anemia-related disease in Sardinia and Cyprus, and it's been, I mentioned Tay-Sachs disease is basically gone from the Jewish, American Jewish population, maybe Europe too, because of this kind of screening. I don't know how many people don't get married as a result, but that's another, that gets into free will and moral decision. In the last 2,000 years, have there been any documented evolutionary traits in humans? Uh, well, 2,000, I mean, 2,000 since Julius Caesar. I don't, I'd, I'd probably, that's a little too recent. I'd, I'm sure there have been slow ones, and there may have been major ones, and I, I'm not sure what example I'd give. But in the last 5,000, there has been one, there have been a few very clear cases, resistance to malaria in Africa and in Asia due to many different mutations in different parts of the world in genes related to blood production and, and resistance to the parasites life cycle in our bodies. And the, the other cl another classic case, well, pretty well documented, is in people who have had cattle br uh, dairying, who have used milk as a source of nutrients. There's a particular gene that allows adults to continue to make the enzyme lactase, which digests the milk sugar lactose. And that mostly, in most mammals, that disappears at weaning. But in some populations, that gene is still active in adulthood. And people who have that active gene, like me, can still drink milk as adults. And that has, the evidence genetically is that that's been favored by natural selection in Europe and in some parts of Africa independently. And our, our last question. What research questions are you trying to answer in your lab right now? We're looking at uh, craniofacial development as an experimental system in mice, and we're also looking at baboons to try to come to grips with the kinds of complexity that I'm talking about. And we're finding it even in a very carefully designed, very variation-limited kinds of study. Even then, you see the same kinds of complexity. And my own, my, my point of, my, my objective is to try to come to grips with the complexity Try to make people b believe that it's real. Try to ask if there's a better way to think. And if not, uh, why are we pursuing ahead with the same methods that we're, that we're doing? But, uh, but I don't have magic answers. If I did, you know, as I always say, if I had the answer, I'd be in Scandinavia getting my Nobel Prize. I wouldn't be talking to the likes of you. <laughs> <laughs> well, the likes of us are very grateful, Dr. Kenneth Weiss. <laughs>